Hey, welcome back to uh, section, I'm going to call it 3B uh, slash 4. So uh, as 3 tends to be the, the crux of everything, that's why we sandwiched it right there in the middle. Um, we'll go back, touch on a few things, um, just to bring everybody up to speed. Uh, we've, we've basically figured out our samples, we've isolated our samples, we started some detection methods, and now we're doing some major cytometry work. Um, we're walking through how to set up your instrument. Um, most of these things are based on the instrument we have, which is the Cytoflex, but they translate pretty well to uh, multiple platforms. So, uh, you know, if you're watching this, don't be concerned. Um, you don't have to go out, buy a bunch of new products, uh, you know, or you can find one of us and we'll help you. <laughs> so, um, what's the other things I, I need to say is questions, please, as they come up, type them in. Um, once again, towards the, you know, the last session, we will be doing it, I believe is a live stream so we can answer your questions, have some feedback. Uh, you know, otherwise we're here. It's, a, as you can see, it's sunny today. I'm in the lab instead of stuck in my basement. Um, still have Alfonso with us and Jenna, who is also in the lab. Um, so that she can share uh, some stuff. And she's now taking back on her role as the, uh, the less confused, but still needing help, uh, you know, kind of cytometry uh, lab manager. So uh, put your seatbelt in on, you know, and let's, uh, let's go for a wild ride here. So uh, let's, uh, let's start with going through where we ended. So, uh, we kind of ended with setting the machine up, using your, your QC to get you to a, a place where you can identify noise, start to see the separation, um, and talking about how the different scatters give different properties. Um, where we, we kind of need to pick up is, what do we do for, for better quality control? Uh, we know we've done the instrument quality control. We have all that information um, available. We, we can do the Levy Jennings plots to make sure that the machine is staying consistent. Um, but we need something that's going to be more uh, amiable to uh, this, this portion where we're looking at very small particles. Um, and we kind of blew through that there are multiple silica particles, polystyrene particles, fluorescent particles. Um, if you're doing fluorescence, there's a MESF or just kind of a, a also, I guess what you'd call EF, right? Just equivalent fluorochrome. Because um, not all fluorochromes are gonna have a corresponding MESF set. So I think they limit those to mostly like FITSEs and PEs, maybe APC, I'm not, I can't remember. Um, but if you say, oh, I'm using something like a Brilliant Violet, I believe you can do something equivalent with like a Pacific Blue um, type bead array. So, but that's a lot just to cover in a small time. So we're gonna kinda give that a overarching broad uh, and then say, do a little legwork, you know, go onto the, uh, the intraweb. Uh, <laughs> I think there's this thing called Goggle. Am I saying it wrong? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Google. Um, <laughs> so you can do that and find those things or that's maybe some questions that you can, you can launch if you have a particular one. Uh, so back to it. Um, personally, we've said we love to use NIST traceable beads um, simply because you can buy them and they, they come basically, they should come in a bucket, but they come in a small bottle <laughs> that, you know, it has multiple, multiple uses. We're, you know, what is it? Someone joked, I think it was Joanne Lanigan that joked that, you know, if you need beads for 50 to 100 years, um, <laughs> these are your products. Uh, we talked about other companies that put out these multiple peaks with flor fluorescence um, and non-fluorescent, so a mix of polystyrene and silica. Uh, um, I think with Rosetta, they have a bead array. Um, John Nolan has different bead arrays and biologicals. So there's a little bit of what's best, biologicals, beads, or do we need a best and just basically a platform, a protocol? So if we just have something that we stick to with our, our controls, um, then 
we can legitimize it and, and use different softwares to, to kind of start getting quantitative curves or uh, quality control be based in some sort of uh, viral particle or a liposome um, or you know if you have well characterized platelet EVs so there are options um, we tend to use and I believe Alfonso is in the in the same boat so uh, Jenna since we're supposed to be directing this to you okay. uh, we like to use a, a beads bead sets and biologicals so we'll set things up with beads so that we can make sure the instrument is exactly where we want it to be day to day and we put the biologicals on as a very nice reference control so that things are a little more uh same right because we have some issues that can come up like i believe it was the last session we started talking a little bit about me theory right as i like to joke it's all about me um <laughs> and i guess you so and then on top of that uh, you have to kind of with that comes the refractive index of things. So while beads are great, they're standard. Um, you know, you you find some good ones. Also remember, not all beads are created equally. Um, companies which you don't you have to kind of read. They give they say, oh, it's 100 nanometer. Well, that can mean it's 80 to 120 for some. They, there's a, a different span. So you got to be careful with that. Uh, this is why we go with NIST. Supposedly, you know, it's their name, you know, <laughs> they're the Institute, right, of standards. So let's go back to Alfonso in a, in a couple of uh, some more of these tips and tricks. Um, I think we're going to look at some of those beads right now um, as I have them uh, on my particular Cytoflex all set up to talk about. I know Alfonso has some from his uh, and Jenna's in front of it to help us share all that wonderful data. So. Like I said, put your seatbelt in. We're going for a little more of a of a crazy ride. We're gonna talk more uh, like uh, auctioneers today, a little faster. So to try to put it all in for you. Uh, so Alfonso, welcome back. It looks like Dublin's got another sunny day, which not really. It's oh, light, but not sunny. Uh, okay, quite rainy, in fact. Uh, uh, but I will not complain too much. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we have a fantastic April, and the beginning is of May is not so bad. So I will not complain about the weather today. <laughs> so um, Jenna, uh, John, hey, hi, and the rest hey. of the people. Yep. <laughs> so um, one of the first things, um, and remember what, what we were talking the, um, uh, in the previous session, was um, that we, we look at forward scatter as one of the parameters for size, usually. But this is, this is not working quite well in particles. And, and the main reason is because we have a blocking bar there, a blocking part of this, of this light, which is good for the cells, but for, um, for the particles that we are working with, it's far more difficult. Um, and, and we have seen on the previous day as well, uh, how side scatter seems to be a bit better. Uh, the side scatter that we are working with, mostly of the time in flow cytometry is with the blue laser. But I remember um, somebody publishing some papers about uh, using the violet side the scatter. Before we go ahead with that, uh, let me go back as well to another instrument that we have mentioned, which is the nanosite. If you remember the nanosite, uh, it's one of the instruments or, uh, that we can choose the laser. When you're buying it, you have to choose which one of the lasers that you want to use. And that depends on the application that you have to use. So we have on one side, the blue laser, or you can buy the near UV, or you can buy the red. If you're working with aluminum or very dense things, the company recommends you to use the red laser. And that's because the particles will scatter a lot of light. So we, we don't need so much energy on the wavelengths to excite and produce all, all that light. But we, if we are working with very small particles, like in our case with the EVs, uh, but they are not as dense as the metals that we, we have mentioned before, they will scatter far less light. So we need a little bit more power. And that's why they recommend you to go for ultraviolet, but the problem is that could be too bright and too energetic and they will destroy everything. So what we think we could, we could use is a balance. So we can go for 
near UV or we can go to violet, which is a bit more energetic than the, than the blue. And that's when uh, this paper makes sense for me, which is why we don't use the violet laser together with the blue, because that will help us to distinguish a little bit more between our EVs from the noise. And I think that paper, I always refer to the same one, and it's not because he's here. It's always because I do the same thing. It's a one from Basilis, John Tiggs, and Jenny. So <laughs> that paper is a fantastic paper. For me, it's one of the reference to explain about, about this one. So what I will ask you uh, is to change the configuration because we have that capability in, in your instrument. You have a violet laser. So we can use not just the side the scatter that is coming from the blue laser, we can also use the side the scatter, the scatter that is coming from the violet, okay? So one of the things we can do is changing that configuration. And this is something we can do not just on the Cytoflex, we, we have a bunch of instruments that they have multiple lasers, so we can change those filters. Changing a filter is not too difficult, to be honest. Um, it's just opening the door, see where the filters are, and take them out. Be careful. Don't break them, okay? So filters are, for instance, this is not the one for the Cytoflex. This is a filter. Uh, let me see if I can focus there. Uh, somewhere there. No, it's not so clear. But it's telling you, uh, in this case, it's a 405 uh, forward slash 10 polarized filter. And I bought it for my BD fax area. <clears throat> At the same time, I have another filter here. This is a filter for a Cytoflex, slightly different. You can see the light, far smaller, okay? Never put the finger on top of the glass. Don't do it, or I will oh, show no. you. <laughs> so don't do it, basically. And when you're playing with the filters, be careful, super careful. If you see any dust, don't do it as well, okay? There are many no, 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 but you can do it. You can change those filters, yeah. okay? So depending on where your instrument is, you have to place that one. So in this case, what I will ask you, Jenna, is if you, if you don't mind to open the setup okay. and place that uh, configuration. So if you don't mind to share your screen. Okay. And we're your screen. Excellent. Okay. That's your set of different filters. Um, you can show that we have the red laser there. You can see the yellow laser, the blue, the infrared. And if you scroll down, you can see that we have violet and near UV. So if you see in the violet, we have our 405 forward slash 10. So exactly the same one that we have here, 405 forward slash 10. Same filter when the, in, in a different instrument. Okay, so what we need to do is swap that one for the first one, for the 450 Pacific Blue, okay? So we can just edit uh, our configuration and place that filter and just swap them. Uh, you have one already created, right? Uh, yeah, I think uh, this one here is yep. the 450 and the 405 swap here only. Yep, so, so basically what you need to open is the cover of the, of the instrument. One second. Uh, yep. Which is basically doing this. Whoop. So it's not too hard rock seconds. So open that one. <laughs> if we can see. I don't you know can, if it's yeah. what happens if you keep your cytoflex in the dryer too long. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> temperature. <laughs> temperature. <laughs> this, this is a new design for the cytoflex for micro vesicles. <laughs> yes. You need small cytoflex for small particles. I like it. I, uh, you know. So Wonderful that's marketing exactly what tool. she's doing is changing now the filter. It's, as you can see, it's not too difficult. Uh, there are two positions there. You can see the first one and the second one. Uh, it's basically for traveling the instrument. You put it up, and if you push a little bit more, it's, you're in a stable place. Um, um, I'll ask the devil's advocate question. Does it matter which one you switch? Yes, it matters. <laughs> I find out. Um, you, you have to place the 405 in the first place. And um, the same for, uh, I will explain later on. Um, if you place the 405 in a later position, 
uh, the problem is all the fluorescence will be affected. You will see a drop down on the on the sensitivity on the colors. So the recommendation uh, after I seen it, uh, definitely the recommendation is to place it on the 405 uh, on the 450. Um, what I will ask you, Jenna, is as well, mm -hmm. if you don't mind, no worries. Could you go to the red side the scatter detection? Perfect. Run, run. You see there, you have a three uh, six three eight forward slash six, which corresponds to another filter that I have here. I have four filters. <laughs> I have four filters here. Okay. And they fit in the tiny side of wax. Wow. I have four different ones for four different lasers that I have. So I will ask you as well to change that one or we can do it uh, later for the APC. And again, I, my recommendation now is to change it for the APC. Again, because you can see that there is a slightly uh, difference on, on the sensitivity. You can see a drop down on the staining index when you're running, for instance, um, AP beads. So you can see the drop down on the sensitivity. Um, the red laser is not as much affected as the light on the violet laser. So if it's going into the APC or uh, Alexa Fluor 700 or 750, it's not that affected. If you go to um, another ones on the violet, you can see a big uh, issue there. So remember, you have to change the filters. So my recommendation is scatter on the first one and then the other ones play around. Uh, on the side of flex, the other thing you have to take care of is where you place them. So there are slightly differences on the APDs. And what you need to do is, uh, there are like 600 below and above. If you have a 600, yes. make sure that you have uh, any filter in the 600 or above. If you're in the 525, anything that is below that place, uh, you can place a filter there. Um, so they're, they're not equal. <laughs> so they have to be slightly um, free. Uh, I think Beckman Coulter has a poster indicating how to change those filters and where to place um, if you need to change filters for customized filters. Yeah, Next we've thing. tried it, Alfonso, and you do lose a little bit, but it will work. It will so work. If you, have, yeah. if you have a fluorochrome that you'd have to put in, you can make the swaps. Um, yeah. You know, you try to do it in an optimized type way, but it, it, you're not limited. Um, no, no, no. APDs are sensitive enough to still get you some some good output. So if yeah. someone brings you something APC wise or a what they call a far red um, type uh, membrane dye, you can do it. Most of the times, you may be able to switch those over to the yellow. Yeah, because the five sixty one will excite most of that, and you can bring it up. Um, You're right. This, the instrument is super sensitive, uh, and and I haven't detected any issues because of the sensitivity. Yeah. Uh, only when I try with, with uh, AP beats is when I found that big difference. Uh, it's like, whoa, I was suspecting super, and I just see, wow. <laughs> so I want the super wow. Yeah. <laughs> so that, was, that was the only reason. But um, once I see in it, if I have to recommend now, I prefer to recommend that way. Yeah, so if you actually have something like this to set where an APD has a sensitivity or you have, um, you know, very sensitive PMTs like a silicone PMT or the other way to get around that is, is to buy, um, a high power laser. So if you're dealing with, like you said, you have the Aria, we have the Aria and the Astrios. Um, and we have like the blue is pretty effective cause it's, we're pumping out 200 milliwatts uh, of laser light. Um, I know, I believe it's a, it's Vera, um, my friend in Canada that I think she has a 300 milliwatt laser on her area. Um, she does a lot of virus particles and stuff and they look beautiful because you don't increase noise because you don't have to bring the PMT up. So by not bringing the voltage up and just getting more from the light scattering, you have the same result. So uh, like I said, it's not etched in stone that you do this the exact way on this. It's just kind of a, we're giving you that guidance on, um, you know, things to look at. So, mm -hmm. and it just so happens that Alfonso and, and my lab have the exact same instrument. So it works out beautifully. Excellent. All right. So you have it? Yep, you I have it. And I remember to use that as current configuration. Yeah. 
So uh, two, two more things here. You can see that you, you have the option there to say uh, red side scatter. You can also see the 561 on the yellow. So that could be acting as, as a side scatter for the yellow green laser. Mm -hmm. But in this case, the, uh, the cytoflex is blocked for the, uh, for the scatter light from the yellow laser. So you cannot use that one, or you cannot use the one from the near UV or infrared if you have those options, okay? So um, in this case, you, you should buy them. Uh, as customized filters, uh, but even if you buy them, apparently the, the this um, this uh, light is is uh, blocked. But if you have another instrument, uh, is there the light is there? Okay. So what we'll do is we'll work basically now with the violet laser, and later on I will explain why you want this red laser uh, scatter. Okay. Okay. Uh... Must stay hydrated. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, biological controls. So you go yep. ahead. So what do you have? You run a few, a few of these samples already with controls. Uh, yes. A little bit yes. on there. We've been. The only issue may be is that when you see them crossed out, because she changed the configuration. Let's just say that the guy who runs most of this stuff is slightly lazy. <laughs> I am lazy. So he doesn't <laughs> change it per se, just changes the filters, not the naming. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to throw him under the bus and say, this guy um, is very lazy. And instead of doing, that's exactly what he does. So instead of it saying violet side scatter, it'll still say uh, you're brilliant violet 421 mm. uh, on a lot of them or the 450 whatever it has as it's it's label for these I forget how I did it um, I'd yeah. have to look again so uh, let's so you change them so it's a it's gone but yeah yeah don't I've keep crossing it out <laughs> so, yeah yeah J Jenna um, yes. you remember from the previous uh, day um, so you're working there with Arias, and we were talking. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I like. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was I was working on getting them set up. Right. Um, so um, again, back back to this. Uh, uh, this instrument, in, for instance, is measuring everything in the height, and then it transforms this into area, calculates into area. So which one is the best signal for this microvesicle and EVs or particles or whatever you you want to call them? Because we will be talking with something else. So I. Very small things. I prefer to work with uh, height. Um, that's another thing that, see, we're learning from everybody here. That, so I guess because of the other protocols that I've done where I'm using a, a one particular scatter, so in this case, it would be violet side scatter. I then display uh, my others on the area, uh, or we started doing it on the, the Astrios where I would display the height but because of the configuration of that one, I can do forward scatter versus side scatter and get good plots. Like I said, we have a 200 milliwatt blue laser. So on, on the actual uh, PMT upgrade on the forward scatter, so you get a lot more signal. Long story short, um, I use areas on here simply because once I, I have a height as a threshold, but I don't wanna see the cuts on the threshold aesthetics right it has nothing to do with the actual data right it looks pretty um so you don't get that chop at the end yeah so we display the height also in in different graphs but when i show data i use the areas for my violet side scatter area um, mm -hmm. versus side scatter area or fluorescence whatever the case may be mm -hmm. so this is a case of Feel free to, to, do, to do the right thing. Um, obviously, I, I, I make certain things up as I go along. It doesn't, you know, give bad data. It's just, you know, when you get samples that you, you know, and you're just like, okay, I'll run them. I'll do it right now. Um, you take shortcuts. Yeah. <laughs> or at least I do. So Definitely we are lazy. Do as I say, not as I do. Um, <laughs> So we'll call it creative flow. Uh, there's, a, there's a separate charge for that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So you have there uh, forward scatter and side scatter. So that will be the first graph, uh, and we will see how how be, uh, how is the side scatter compared to the forward scatter really clearly. On the other side, you have uh, violet side scatter versus Fitzy, and that's probably because uh, you will show us some some of the controls that they have uh, labeled on on the green side of Fitzy. Yeah. Uh, and then you have side scatter versus uh, Fitzy. And what I will ask you later on, so we'll start with those ones, I will ask you to change one of them for violet side scatter so we can compare the signal of violet versus uh, the blue. And what I will expect to see is a, a direct di diagonal between both signals. So it's showing that it's as violet as blue. There is no other reason for not doing it, right? But in theory, uh, the violet, based on uh, Teague's paper, is stronger <laughs> compared to the blue. So what we will see is kind of a, a comma rather than a diagonal, showing that the blue has the violet has more sensitivity to separate populations compared to um, the blue. So when okay. you're ready, can you show us one of the data sets that you have recorded already? Oh, I think I have it. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what John said. Oh, nothing. I'm just talking oh. myself. <laughs> See? All right. <laughs> um, there you go. So, what do you have there is PVNC, uh, PVs. We're going to have to go yeah. back to the wrong oh. name stuff. I'm sorry. No worries. No worries. Some people. <laughs> so. I think this is the base PBS background. Mm -hmm. um, and then we ran some apogees. Excellent. So there you can, you can see different, um, different um, beads. You can see the top one, I think it's a 500. Uh, yes. The very top one up here. Uh, that one's five. Uh, the paper's in with you, John, by the way, if you want to get the, it's in the window seal with the rest of them for the exact values of all the apogees. Yeah, no, I believe. Hundreds here, yeah. uh, five hundreds. Yeah. yeah. And the, I think what happens is what Alfonso's trying to get to is that um, certain scatters, right? So we started talking about the difference between the scatters. I believe side scatter gets you around 200 nanometers is where it starts to make that curve. Um, forward scatter is at 500. You can see they start to come out. Um, and this is basically its limits of detection, right? So that's where you start to get the diagonal when the limit of detection starts to kick in mm -hmm. for the other scatter properties. Um, if you actually look at the violet sc side scatter versus side scatter, you'll see that the diagonal starts a little bit earlier. Boom. So if you see there, you have kind of a diagonal, okay? Diagonal that is not that perfect, <laughs> okay? I'll come back to that point later on. You, you can see there, you can, you, you mind to zoom into the three first peaks? The first ones, no, no, uh, or the last one, the other way around, the top ones. Yeah, if you see there, those three sets of beads, they're not one after the other. They're slightly in a different angle. So that means that one of them has more scatter <clears throat> in the in the violet than on the blue. Okay. So okay. we'll come back to the to those ones uh, later on. Don't worry. Could you <clears throat> could you show me in histograms the three okay. scatters that we have? So scatter for the full scatter, scatter for the blue side, the scatter, and scatter for the violet. So pretty. So that's violet, that's the blue. Uh, we need to zoom them out and that's forward scatter. Good. So could you zoom them out again, please? Oh, yep. Perfect. So if you see, I, I can see one very sharp peak on the forward scatter. Could you uh, use the uh, 
selection mm -hmm. region to select those ones. Uh, oof, I, I cannot point it. <laughs> you want on the um, forward scatter? Forward scatter? Okay. Yep. That's the only peak that you can see sharply here. But let's assume. Uh, no, the, the bar, please. Oh, we just bar. want you to gate it. Oh, again. oh gate it. Ah, okay. Gate that one. Uh, keep going down. There you go. That's the one. So that's the first one that you can see. <laughs> right? So if you go to the to the violet, you can see that you have four more peaks there that you cannot detect on the violet, on the forward scatter. Now it's starting to be, be more complicated to select them. Can you zoom out a little bit on side the scatter on the histogram? Because <laughs> I, I cannot see the peaks. <laughs> zoom out again. No, that's a log in the in the X. Up, oh, no, uh, keep in the linear log. Log on the X. Zero. And just and just, just put fit with sample on the sample. count. On the count, Jenna. Down, 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 oh. down. There you go. Fit to sample. There we go. <laughs> Yay! Yay! <laughs> okay, sorry, that took me a second. I have figured out what you're trying to ask me now. Yeah. So if you see there, the distance between. Uh, the different peaks on the violet side scatter is far better. So it's giving you far more resolution to separate populations of your EVs than if you're using the forward scatter. Okay, you can resolve more populations using the violet compared to the blue, but also you can resolve more populations or a bit better your violet versus your, your blue. And, and these are with the Apogee Vs. But if we change and we use the, another kind of beats, another set of beats, like the Mega Mix, for instance, the difference is, is enormous. You can see uh, the violet is far, far better. And that's due to the composition of the beats that you're using. Or when you're working with the Rosette, as you can see, again, a big difference on, on the different scatters. And that distance is not equal between the different samples. OK? Uh this particular mix is of 100, uh, 150, and 200. Yep. So. Cool. Yeah, the hack that set this program, set this <laughs> particular protocol up, at least knows what the sizes are. So. There you um, go. So, yeah, to perfect. make it a little prettier, that's just another bead set that we use. And then I don't think we have another one recorded in yeah, but that, this that's guy. perfect for what I, I was trying to show you. Um, if you see there, you have the, the distance between the first peak on the left <laughs> compared to the second peak. You can see now that it's not diagonal, so it's a little bit flatter at the beginning, and then it starts to increase, okay? So that means that at the beginning, we have less sensitivity to dis discriminate between the noise, I think the first one is noise, compared to the first set of beats or the first set of beats and the second set of beats, okay? So you have far more sensitivity on the violet compared to the blue. Trying okay. to see if I can get all forget the graphs the up here. Scatter. Forward scatter, yeah. forget about it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, get rid of the forward scatter, boo. Uh, <laughs> that's how we say in Spanish. This is, yeah, this is how we start to eliminate uh, possibilities is, you know, like I said, forward scatter looks very nice. You can see in the middle plot there on the top. It looks nice in order to just separate and get nothing on, the, on a diagonal. You just get this straight line. Because when you're down at the levels of, of 100 nanometer even bead, it won't pick it up. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, yeah. and some of this was to set it up. Some of this is to show that even at 200 nanometers, you don't see anything yet. Um, Whereas the side scatter starts around that 150, as you can see there. Um, so we start to say, okay, well, side scatter's a, a better option. And this, is, this has been known for years. We're not, you know, we're not opening some uh, huge, huge uh, exploration and we've discovered the you know, <laughs> hieroglyphics there. But um, you know, there are quite a few of I HIV uh, yeah. those viruses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's throw up. I don't uh, know which one. 
So some of them, uh, what, what I did was I have HIV under violet side scatter, I have it under fluorescence, and I was doing some count stuff. Yes. I don't remember which one's the good HIV to show. And it's not bad. If you go to the fluorescent one, you can actually, so go down where it says fluorescent, yep. So this is just a fluorescent trigger to show all the positive ones. And then, like I said, I try to do them both um, so I did violet side scatter so I could show the entire thing. Um, like you said, Alfonso, so you can have who's positive, who's negative, what you might be losing. Um, and some of it's as simple as taking a background and then seeing how much comes in after you have the background in. So if you just hit the, uh, the violet side scatter one, HIV, FV, SSC, two up from where you are. So that starts to give kind of more of a picture there. Um, that's the height. Notice I say, see how it cuts off? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so if you go to even different, a, a different parameter, like side scatter height, um, you get a little better look at it. So I was just playing around with a bunch of different settings. Um, you can see even different things with the apogees and so but this was actually for an experiment so that we could do a little counting. Um, like we had talked about how the count is important and you can actually get a count because of the peristaltic pump. Um, this is something we've done with a couple of groups with known quantities of things. So we've tested it um, with beads, with biologicals. Um, I would say plus or minus 5%, um, 5 to 10. I don't want to be too. Uh, crazy with that but wait so i want to say though we're, we're not saying that we're seeing everything to be able to count we're counting what we see <laughs> you're now in, in the apogee sample uh would you mind yep. to select the green particle okay you want to go back green? down to the oh you, you were i think on the apogee already you can use yeah. any of the apogees any of the apogees so yeah i was already on one of them yeah so, so if, if you see there you have the 100 and you have the uh, 500 uh, green ones so if you're struggling to try to drop down and you don't know where to stop what you can use is the threshold uh, start with the threshold on fluorescence because that, that will remove a lot of background and a lot of noise that is, by using just a side scatter it will be quite complicated so um just starting with the threshold on the fluorescence and you are starting to drop down and suddenly you can see 100 you draw a region around the 100 and now i will try to drop down with my side scatter or my violet side scatter all the way down to reach that point okay so uh, you can see it's quite well separated so uh, if i were uh, a novel user i will start first with the fluorescence scattering rather than working directly with the with the fluorescence, uh, fluoresce, fluorescence from the Fitzy rather than the scattering. <laughs> Try to you get that understood out. me, right? Yes, <laughs> I get it. what you're saying, starting with the fluorescence one to find these population here. Yeah. And so then that go one back to the. Easier, far easier to, to start with rather than starting with side scatter. Make a gate around this. This is where I want to see my, my fluorescence. And now dropping down. And play with your uh, threshold dropping down on the on the blue or violet side scatter. By the way, question, John. Yes. Do you use side scatter, violet side scatter, or violet and side scatter uh, blue, or violet side scatter, or <laughs> blue um, side scatter. I've tried all of the above. Uh, so I've played around with all the different side scatters um i put them together uh separated them did ands ors uh so every iteration i could think of is somewhere uh in in the data sets um you know just depending on what i wanted to look for some of these were just for consistency's sake of looking at the gfp because we were trying to get the counts um which goes along with a different project so, and basically some of these in here too, there's other folders that have the fractionations and 
uh, some membrane dyes. I think you might see some things that say far red in them, Jenna. Uh, uh, yeah, we do have a far red, I think, up here. Yeah. So that was, well, the HIV didn't really. That, that was a different issue that wasn't related to it not picking it yeah, up. Yeah, so was... you can see sample 10, 11, 12, 13. I think if you go up to sample one, you'll see some stuff there. Uh, so some of these, yeah. That's the other thing. You got to train your brain that they don't look normal. Yeah, I think he had the ones, maybe it's not on this one, that they had fluorescence in them. I thought it was a different set than this, to be fair. Yeah, uh, but you can see I started playing sharing. around with the, the 100 yeah. mist, like you said, with violet side scatter, red side scatter, uh, the combinations, um, just to one? see the separation. Give me that one, because we haven't, I told you to change that filter, but I haven't mm -hmm. shown you the secret behind that. <laughs> okay, so can you go? I think it's the second one. I don't know how good the sample is. Uh, so this would be the second one with the red apogee. that he did. Second apogee. Second, oh, second apogee. apogee. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Okay. So if you remember, uh, I told you you have that one, and you can see uh, those three differences. Uh, can you show me now the uh, blue side scatter against red side scatter? Or just keep that one, keep that one, and just beside where you see forward scatter. On the next graph, yeah. yeah remove forward scatter, we don't need it. Okay. Um, we'll change that to. Just keep, keep that one, that's a uh, side scatter, blue. that one there, yeah. And then we'll do the there you go. Thing. So we have the same. So that's violet versus uh, blue, so that's the same. On the other one, you have red versus side scatter. It's quite similar. So there's no big advantage on that, right? It's just prettier. It's prettier. That's it. Just because it's rounder. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now, can you show me red versus violet, please? These are some lovely spring colors we have going too, Jen. <laughs> this is what you decided on last time. I haven't changed the colors. <laughs> Way to sell me out. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. I'm getting into my pastels. <laughs> they were easier to see, to be fair. Yeah. So you can see now, again, this, this change on the, on the shape, uh, indicating that at the beginning, it looks more sensitive on the violet, which is uh, what we are thinking. But later on, if you see on the top side, this kind of a mess. It's not definitely a, a diagonal. You go closer. Yeah. Suddenly, you, you can start to see those different populations in different angles. So that means that they are scattering light in a completely different way. It's not scattering the same amount of light, not in the bottom and not in the top. Okay, so that could help us to distinguish as well on your EVs because there are loads of different things changing on the scatter of, the, or of your EVs. I think you're think getting it a very good picture of the difference between the polystyrenes and the silicates yeah. in this and how they scatter light. Not to mention that the polystyrenes are the ones that have fluorescent color. So let me, let me go to that one. Uh, I, if you don't mind, uh, Jenna, mm -hmm. could you stop your sharing? Because I have something similar uh, on my screen, but I have far more numbers. So let me drop this down, zoom here. So what I will do is sharing now my screen with you. All oh, right. Sharing is caring, Alfonso. Sharing is caring. Yeah, <laughs> I learned that. <laughs> so what but I will not do now, is, not while you're locked up at home. No, no sharing. No, no, no. <laughs> not everything Six can feet. be shared. So what I will do is I'll create something similar to what you have. Okay. So I'll create a dot plot here, uh, black and white, and you will see why I want to do it. So I have log and log. Uh, but this is on forward scatter. So I said, I don't like area. I prefer to work with heights. So the default ones, I'll change it to forward and side. And, and then change this again to log and scale. So I'm doing the same that you have been doing. The only thing is we have 10 to the 7.2 and up. There you go. So forward scatter, it's a crap. So we'll, we'll ignore it completely. Okay. So we'll go now to the other combination, which was with the violet side of the scatter. And again, what I will do is place this one in log. So you can see 
again, we have a quite similar picture to what you have. I'll make a copy of this one. I will place now here your red, your red or my red, it's the same uh, profile. Back again to log, and I will do the same thing. 7.2 and move these things slightly up. So you can see the shape again is quite similar to what you, you were showing. And back again, in this case, red versus blue. And you can see um, quite similar display. Okay. Now, if I go closer, I can see what I mentioned before, um, that they are not following that diagonal. You can see it's, it's just jumping. And I can see one that is following the diagonal and another one is following as, as well that diagonal. Let me go back and you can see that. Okay, so suddenly we have parallel populations. The interesting thing is that we can do something even nicer. We can go here. As John said, we have some of them with the green. So we will choose here, Fitzy. And let me back again, this down. And so I can see nicely those particles that you were showing that they are green with the non-green. Okay, top green particles. Now, if I go to this population here, for instance, if I select that one, uh, you can see where it's located in the other ones. Okay, Ooh. you can see that mostly of those particles I selected are FITSI positive. Yeah. Right? Now, if I go to the one that has exactly the same side scatter than this one, but lower on, on fluorescence, it's negative. Okay, so this one pink, I've put this one because it's the green one. Yeah, yeah, another green, there you go. <laughs> this one that has more side scatter on the violet is the one that has less side scatter, the same side scatter, but it's no label. If you look at the red side scatter, it's also high for the ones that are labeled. Okay, now look at this other population that we have in parallel here. Look at that one. This one here, that is in parallel. So it's more violet in this case, or less red, okay? That one is negative, okay? And let me explore this population that we have here that is brighter in green, where it's located. Oh, wow, nice, because I can see that one is green. So these two here, this one and this one, or if you prefer, I can expand this polygon. Those two are now labeled with Fitzy. And they have a slightly different scattering than the ones that they are not labeling, which is basically what you were saying, the my theory and the protection. The way I explain it, <laughs> if you get a, a balloon and you Ooh, get a balloon and you make it nice, clear, white, it will go through some light through, okay? And they reflect some light. But as soon as you put, um, you know, this nail uh, paint, you put that cover all around, the amount of light that they will scatter is completely different. Okay, so yep. that could be an easy way to explain probably what uh, all these physicians will explain in a far better way than me, <laughs> why we have those changes on the scattering. And this is something that we have to consider if we are working with EVs, that not all EVs, they, first, the structure is different, so they will scatter the light in a different way. They will have some lipids, they will have some proteins. The cargo itself will be different. The cytoplasm, where they're coming from, will be different. The proteins that they have is different. The RNA cargo will be different. And in some cases, we are using those, well, not me, but my cells, they might be using it to discard things that they could be poison. Okay, so they are releasing some stuff that could be quite toxic for, for my cells. So the cargo will also have an impact on, on the refraction index. And this could help us to identify those differences on the populations. 
or that's what I'm thinking. I, I do agree. Um, I always explain it similar to you. Um, so if you're thinking I can use your balloons, yeah. some, <laughs> some of them are different simply because some are just your nice latex balloons. Some of those fancy mylar balloons and they're going to scatter when they come out in the sunshine differently. One's dull, right? Let's, let's face it. I also think of it as like stained glass, right? If I have a nice piece of glass, it's going to reflect the light in a certain way. If I then color that glass, I stain that glass, each and every piece of light that goes through it is going to look different. And we've actually seen this when doing studies with uh, MGMT mice. So to bring it back to reality, um, you have GFP and TD tomato. And even though the particles are the same size by all other methods, they scatter completely differently. Simply because one is red, one is is basically green. Um, just by having those fluorescent proteins, they, they put the light out in different manners. We've also seen that um, with the HIV samples that we have. Uh, the problem is though that they label them with M-cherry and M-cherry is very dim comparatively speaking. So it's not as conclusive, but we have seen it in other models. Um, and so you're exactly right. You can tell a lot about something simply by using different scatters against each other. Um, it'd be great if everything was a diagonal. I see a lot of more diagonal on my asteroids. Um, it seems like things are created more equally. Uh, <laughs> and they show up about the same. Instrument and how the, young, the, the, the yeah. mirrors are selected, et cetera, that could change completely. But yeah, this, and again, that's, that's why I have no one, that's why I have four filters. So yeah. As well, at the different at the different lasers. So, if you have the possibility to try, you you will see in the different instruments um, that you can see first similar patterns in different in the different lasers, but also you can see slightly differences between one equipment uh, and the other. Yeah. So, so this tells you a lot about simply the refractive index being different of different uh, materials, and about you know labeling versus non-labeled. So a lot of the thought is if you get them labeled and really bright, they're going to look bigger, right? So um, this is why sizing is a relative thing, right? Although <laughs> we're cytometrists, everything is relative to us, right? Uh, like we said, they try to put things into actual units. Everything for us is arbitrary units. You know, you show, we show threshold. Hey, set your threshold to a thousand. What does that mean? <laughs> Nothing. Um, on a different instrument, it could mean that it's 15,000, right? It all depends. It's based on your gain. It's based on what you see for noise. So the way Alfonso was doing it, of, of looking for the noise and moving the threshold accordingly, never mentioned it should be around this number. It's irrelevant, right? Um, maybe your instrument was just tuned up, and it's beautiful and perfect. So now things are a little bit different. You have maybe some less noise, better signal. And then, you know, two months from then, you haven't really cleaned it all that well. You, you're like me, you got lazy. Um, and so you see the noise is a little bit different. So, you know, these are just things to think about. So um, I think this is, is a great kind of tool, using these type beads to get that information. Um, mm. You know, you can even take your bead sets that – they don't even have to be fluorescent. You could do this simply by putting in uh, the same size and try polystyrene, silica, and say a hollow sphere. Or we've done it where we've mixed up our 100 nanometer polystyrenes, 100 nanometer silica, and the 92 nanometer HIV, and they don't sit in the same spot, even though they're all supposed to be relatively the same size, um, simply because they all have different refractive index, and that takes uh into account now depending on how things go you start labeling things you start getting lower i've seen some things i've read some things when you get down to 60 nanometers 50 nanometers that you move from the me almost back to a rayleigh scatter type deal because they end up looking bigger it's almost mind-blowing right like <laughs> why are they moving up the scale that makes no sense um so once you convince yourself again that you're not a dummy um, <laughs> or, <Please> or, <laughs> or 
or at least you can reproduce the same thing over and over. So, I mean, then you stop thinking about it. And I, I forget, but there's some papers published that, that kind of show these, these type things. Um, but you'd need instruments that can go that low. And so most of us don't worry about it because we're never going to get, you know, here we're looking what, about 80 nanometers? Is that what you get, uh, yeah. Alfonso? I was so, able to do it 70. Yeah. It's a different story. Um, and that consistently get with our 80 beads. Yeah, and that's variable too, right? I mean, yeah. day to day, I mean, you have to have the perfect scenarios in order to get that 70 nanometer on a biological. That's 70, with, 80. Uh, violate, violate yeah. control, but with a label that's super bright. And this is not just for this, for beads. You can say, oh, it's just beads. And of course, you have this and that. Um, do you mind showing us, uh, as we come to the end of this session, uh, one of the algae samples? Yeah. So, um, so that's again, it's not published, so please don't copy it. <laughs> 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 so what, what happened is, uh, I like to play things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to play thing, with things, uh, and, uh, the same than you, you know, uh, because we are enjoying it, that's the thing. So it was funny, uh, that suddenly I was looking around for some samples to run and play and try things, and find out some samples that you can see they are from algae from 2012. I don't know why I kept them, <laughs> just because <laughs> sentimental or anything, I have no clue. So I have a series of, of different algae here. Uh, It'll be on a, an episode of Sample Hoarders. <laughs> Water with some algae. So I was thinking maybe I have some parts of the algae still floating around. Um, they could be degraded and they could have some bacteria there. Um, let's, let's, let's see what is happening, right? So what I will do is I'll just use the same thing, uh, remove everything and start from scratch. So first thing, let me show you again, same graphs that I showed you before, um, and height, size is scatter, uh, I guess, so let me put the violet first, and then uh, red and, and blue. So you can see, sorry, um, I want to show things with color, because you're thinking on color, right? So this one, pseudo color, height, violet, blue and red. And I will zoom out. Oh, sorry, logarithmic okay. scale. Ah. It doesn't stay. No. Close. Right, so I'll bring this down and down. So you can see uh, the shape of the same samples again. Uh, this is uh, my limit. This is the thing that you don't want to see, but just hide it there. That's fine. <laughs> and the same here. Just you can play that. with this and hide it. Okay, so these are my different uh, particles. Uh, I can see that these here are around 110 nanometers of particles. So I was thinking, okay, let's, let's put some water from different ponds. And you can see there, I have even paddle. Um, not because I like Pippa Pig, but anyway. <laughs> so here you can see, if I zoom in, in the previous area, all those positions. If I place now my sample, I'll make it bigger uh, so you can see it better. It's a big sample because I did or recording 10 million events or um, for 10 minutes. So the first one that crashed the computer, I will stop. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided just to run and the number of events I stopped was uh, 2 million really. So uh, you can see it's kind of diagonal. So the, both of them, they're not saying anything to me. It says, okay, you have a bunch of things there, right? So this is for one set of those arguments. They, they're not saying too much. Now, if I go to another one, it's still the diagonal. If I go to have a look a little bit more and explore all the different sizes, let me play a little bit this game. I can see this is slightly bigger. And same here. If I go back again. And I change the sample. There's no big difference. Right. If I go to this one.
that's going to look too different, right? But let me zoom in again into this area that looks slightly broader. What do you see there? It that breaks area that looks down. not so, diagonal, that they're broader, suddenly you have one population, two, and three. If I go back again to the previous samples, Uh -huh. Those diagonals that they look slightly broader, they're not diagonals that they're showing us exactly the same thing that we have seen before with the beads. But suddenly you have algae, that I have bacteria, that I have who knows what in those samples, that they're scattering light in a different way. And if we think on the phytoplankton itself, we are working with different morphologies, with different shapes, with different densities, we have the cell walls, we have mucus around them, we have some things floating around to help to move the stuff. So all of that is affecting definitely my side scatter. So if that is affecting my side scatter, scattering the light just because of their own composition or their own structure. And what about the fluorescence? Because we are working with algae. So we can do the same things. So we can just open a new plot here Again, I want to do things in color, in height, I'll keep. So choose one of the scatters, blue, violet, red, I don't care. Which one do you want? Red. Red, Good. yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, sure. So I will select just a few <laughs> of those ones. <laughs> make it up. In, in, different, in different lasers. Even I have, uh, I found here with the infrared, uh, interesting thing here as well. Well, there's so much fun stuff in water. So, so you see here um, some of these any fluorescent chances? detectors, they are not picking up anything. Some others, they are showing some extra stuff. Okay. If, if I select one of these areas here really quickly, and I ask the software to display that particular area, you can see how those ones look like. If I move from one scatter population to another scatter population, you can see the proportions of those ones, they change. Mm -hmm. So that means that the structure inside change and the content change because they might have or not have some chlorophyll, some carotenoids or whatever they have inside. If I change sample, you can see some of those populations remain more or less in the same place, but some others, they dramatically change. You could be thinking, okay, Alfonso, these are very old. Who knows what is in there? City West, that's where I live. Um, sorry for that. <laughs> so I went to the pond <laughs> and I did the same thing. I got some water and I was playing and trying to get the composition of some water from one side. You can see multiple populations the composition changed in a different place of the lake that we have. And you can see again, that composition, again, in terms of fluorescence and scatter is showing me multiple populations that when I'm using just the blue and the violet, I cannot detect. I can see the diagonal on the blue violet, but not in the violet red, or if I show you with the blue, I have even more sensitivity than violet uh, and blue. And that's probably because the wavelengths are quite far one from the other. Yeah. So my hope is to get an instrument with a near UV and infrared because they are even farther. <laughs> so try to stretch that option even hmm. more. I know someone who has one of those. So put me in contact with him, <laughs> please. <laughs> um. <laughs> Nice. You would think it's rainy in Ireland, the way you have so much water at your disposal. Um, <laughs> I'm fully surrounded by water. <laughs> yeah. I, I, maybe I should come over there because I thought it was tropical. <laughs> <laughs> it explains why there's so many pubs. People are like, eh, there's nothing else. It's raining. Where are we going to go? Um, it's a family so. place. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we can start to wrap this session up. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of. I guess we'll do the normal review at the end, you know, uh, where we learned a little bit about changing 
your normal scatter approaches. Um, we talked about, obviously, at the end here, uh, a great point of, um, I'll call it getting more out of the data, right? Is not just looking at a blob of stuff and saying, well, it's a blob. Um, you know, take that deep dive. Uh, it's a, what do they call it? Like the forensic flow cytometry, right? Is, you know, look in, see what's there, and, and then start to make some, some conclusions. Um, as you can see with these different diagonals and things coming off, even with beads, uh, it's a, it's a different way of viewing things. Um, we're so used to looking at the, the one population of cells or, you know, whole blood that from the earliest times looked, has looked the same. You get the, you know, the three different population sets and gate one, uh, this you can see, you start looking at samples and, and this algae is a perfect example of how even extracellular vesicles are very heterogeneous. Um, multiple things going on and who knows what's important and what's not. Uh, so I guess that's the other part, keep all the data um, so that you can do things like this when someone's looking at it uh, and get a big story. So I believe we have session five um, to hopefully wrap all this up and start uh, putting more into it, thinking about it, more of just a free talk, right? sitting there and discussing all these different ideas um, to see how much Jenna has learned in her journey <laughs> into the, the realm of flow cytometry and extracellular vesicles. Um, and as you can see, this is a perfect example of what we started with. You can see from his list and the list previous, there are all kinds of different bead sets. There are all different samples, whether it's algae or some sort of vesicle format. Um, you have all different types of controls. We joke that you get racks of controls and you get just a couple of, of, of samples. And um, again, we'll talk a little bit more maybe in the discussions of what we like to use, but just as kind of that over that kind of overview, um, Alfonso had mentioned using just the, the, the HBSS plus plus or the PBS or whatever you're resuspending things in. Um, add your fluorescence if you're using fluorescence to just that solution to see if you have aggregates, if you have any kind of um, anything that would be giving off an autofluorescence, any of that so that you can separate the very small signals from the background. Um, and other controls are obviously same things you would do if you need any FMOs um, to find those rare populations compensation controls. Uh, this is where we started using things like nonspecific antibodies, label things with IgGs and stuff like that to see. Um, and also just a nice negative control. So that would just be your EVs without anything. Um, and to remember, while it sounds like a daunting task, at the end it is very satisfying. And once you've done it and you can go through it, you can start labeling things whatever you want <laughs> no no label them accurately i'm happy because i didn't even think about it when i pulled that up that i didn't name things the way i usually do you know some some crap that someone gave me uh this sample stinks <laughs> my normal <laughs> labeling technique of uh yeah everything went wrong so <laughs> i actually put decent labels on things um, mostly because I think I was doing stuff that we could compare, uh, Alfonso. <laughs> so for your benefit, I stopped naming things ridiculously. Uh, or just wilder. tubes one through 20. Yeah. So, well, there you go. I did that. Um, that's pretty, yep. yeah. You mentioned Ginny. She used to yell at me all the time because she'd say, where is this file? I said, it's right there. And she goes, okay. You made a folder called small stuff. Um, <laughs> how am I supposed to know? <laughs> no day, nothing. Yeah. Um, and she goes, please do not name something. Oh, crap, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> that tells me nothing. So, all right, tune in for the, for the other episodes. Anything that you haven't seen, go back, rewatch. Um, it's probably funnier if you have a couple of beers before or something to drink. Uh, we look smarter. Water. <laughs> yeah. We look smarter the, the more you 
imbibe. Um, I, I don't have a drink. I'm in lab. So, and uh, <laughs> please tune in for the next one. Questions. Uh, we love those. That's what means uh, we're doing our job. If you don't have any questions, we've either are super smart and giving you everything. Not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Or we're so out of it that you could care less what we're talking about. <laughs> um, so we'd like to get somewhere in the middle. Uh, all right, what's, what do we end with? Uh, hope, you, hope you enjoyed it as much as we are, having as much fun. And please, be careful, stay safe, and hopefully we get back to having some of this scientific fun real soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Alfonso. Thanks, Jenna.